and a very warm uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, we've come together here to listen to Abdullah Hamudi give us the Rashni Kothari Chair Lecture. Uh, Rashni, unfortunately, is not with, uh, here with us today. He, he was meant to come, but uh, he's not able to make it. Uh, but I think I, I, I still need to say a couple of things about, about our relationship with him, really. I mean, I mean, we've named the chair after him. Oh, I mean, in one way of saying is that he is the founder of the center and this is a way of honoring him, but this seems like too formal. Uh, there's another way of expressing it, which is to say that it shows uh, not only that we have a lot of affection for him, but also with, that we deeply respect him. But even that would not be sufficient, I think. It doesn't really capture what, you know, what we feel about him. I think the, the best way, I mean, apart from all these things, I think, uh, you know, all these emotions and uh, relations that I just talked about, I think the best way to put it would be to say that we feel a deep sense of gratitude to him and of and a feeling of indebtedness to Rajni for having given us the center. Uh, these are words that one, you know, one would have thought one uses in some, so for some bygone era, in some bygone era. Uh, these are words that you don't hear these days. But I think we've, we've, we've got, I mean, we've got to recapture these feelings because we really do feel that. For for this uh, uh, for for the for uh, for giving us such a such a wonderful intellectual home, along with his uh, along with his friends and colleagues, who happen to be here, Dhirubhai Sheth and Ashish Nandi, and many others who who are not here right now, but who've also been part of the creation of the centre. So so really i mean thank you is not just a formal english thank you <laughs> this thank you is is in my you know at least as far as i'm concerned i'm sure i say this on behalf of everybody is a is a very deeply felt thank you uh, and i hope some people will convey that to him uh, and we are also i mean and and i also want to say a couple of things about abdullah i mean <clears throat> Abdullah has been a wonderful presence in the center, and not just, not only because he's very reflect, reflective uh, and scholarly and uh, uh, insightful, all that he is, but he's a wonderful presence also because he says to us when he meets us, It doesn't matter, and I'm, when I'm talking about us, I mean all the, the entire center, all the 50 people in the center, from the from the chokidar to the person who gives us tea, uh, to, to 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 the faculty. You know. he, he's, he says it doesn't really matter who you are. I'll relate to you as you are. And uh, that's such a wonderful thing about Abdullah, uh, which, uh, which, is, uh, which strikes you uh, as soon as one, one really encounters him. And uh, Shell told me that uh, the other day that when I, when one, in Namaste, uh, what it really means is, I don't know whether that's true or not, so I hope she wasn't pulling a fast one on me. <laughs> she said, Namaste means I greet the God in you. But at least I can't say that, uh, you know, I don't know what, uh, but Abdullah, when he meets you, certainly says, I greet the person in you. Uh, and also he, 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 would, he, he seems to be saying that I enjoy the bond of sociability that you carry within. And, and also the, the, I mean, since you're an anthropologist, I might as well say it, even though you don't like it, also the culture in you. And, and, so this is, uh, 
no, he really has been a wonderful presence. It's been a short presence. We would have liked it to be much more, but he, I'm very glad that he's accepted to be, uh, to continue as an honorary visiting fellow at the center, even after his term as the Rajni Kutari chair gets over. So thank you, Abdullah. And, and this evening will be chaired by Shell Mayaram, uh, who will introduce him uh, and also uh, perhaps, and, and chair the rest of the, 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 the meeting, Shell. Good evening, friends. Uh, as Rajiv has said, this is a wonderful moment. We're celebrating today Rajni Kothari, and we're also celebrating a Moroccan intellectual who is at the forefront of debates on and, and, and is trying to have some, in trying to construct a critical anthropology. Uh, I'll say some words uh, uh, by way of introducing him to people who, who don't know his work. Uh, Abdullah Hamoudi was professor at the Agronomic Institute of the Muhammad, Univ uh, Muhammad V. Uni uh, University in Rabat, Morocco between 1972 and 1989. In 1990, he was named the first Faisal visiting professor of anthropology at Princeton. From 1994 to 2004, he was the first director of Princeton's Institute, Princeton Institute for the Transregional Study of the Contemporary Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. He's held fellowships at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and at the Wissenschafts College and the Max Planck Institute. Uh, his uh, most recent book uh, is on the Hajj, uh, which I would really recommend uh, that, that you read. It's a wonderful, uh, it's an outer journey as also his own inner journey. And uh, he's also well known for two previous books, uh, one, one titled The Victim and Its Mass, Essays on Sacrifice and Masquerade in Maghreb, and Master and Disciple, The Cultural Foundations of Moroccan Authoritarianism in Comparative Perspectives. And both books have been published by the University of Chicago Press. He is also, uh, in this note which has been handed to me, uh, participated in the production of several films for television. So that's another side. And uh, he's going to present to you uh, a wonderful paper which in a sense synthesizes uh, a lot of what he's been uh, writing about in terms of his own critique on, on, uh, of, of anthropology, Professor Hamoudi. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Rajiv, and th thank you for these wonderful uh, words. And, and thank you, Cher, very, very much. Uh, your words do not uh, surprise me, not because of the qualities that you attribute to me, but because of your qualities of generosity uh, as making me feel comfortable here. Um, I want to uh, first uh, start by saying how much I feel grateful to be here. I uh, want to thank all my colleagues here and the staff for having making this day a very enjoyable learning experience. I also want to say that um, the talk that I'm giving today, I consider just as a manner of homage to R Rajni Kotari chair uh, to celebrate his legacy uh, to this wonderful institution that I have uh, read about and read from, from its uh, uh, researchers for a long time before I had uh, the honor to be invited uh, here for the Rosny Cotterie position. And um, with that, I, I thought that uh, <coughs> I have to say also that I, I've been supported by the staff in a manner that is exceptional and wonderful, and I thank them all. Um, for that, I, I thought it might be um, fitting uh, in India, here in Delhi, 
to give the kind of paper that I'm going to be giving tonight. That, the title of it is Giving and Receiving Yeast, or How to Keep Radically Different Identities Together. And I like the notion of you know, putting yeast in the, in the title, because yeast is that thing that makes other things multiply, swell. And uh, I am hoping that some swelling may happen to me with the things that I learned from you, and that some swelling may happen with the words that I'm dispersing here. Uh, 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 so with that, I, I just want to start this talk by saying that the ethnographic record is now replete with studies of warring identities, forced displacements, and ethnic cleansings, all of which happening in the unprecedented situation of globalized mobility and radical unsettling of categories of thought and modes of action. Uh, some recent papers of, on these things are by Apadurai and Geertz and others. It's a common enough theme now in my discipline. As the distribution of these phenomena ranges across the world, the pressing questions they put to us also range across our academic disciplines. In what follows, I want to analyze a localized event celebration in which Jews and Muslims in 1950 and in, small, in a small Moroccan town called Demnet exchanged yeast and other items. Demnet is here. I have ha drawn with the help of Pravin uh, this uh, more or less readable map just to tell you that India, uh, that Demnet is a small town here south of Morocco. And here is Demi. Uh, technically, it's possible to walk all the way with some you know, frontiers and, 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 and like. Uh, <coughs> it was called that, that uh, 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 the event occurred within the reenactment re every year of the Jewish festival called Passover. Uh, in Arabic, we called it Pesach. Pesach. It was called Mimuna. That's the key word. It was that I will comment on. It was called Mimuna, and it was known throughout North Africa and elsewhere in the Muslim world. Uh, uh, thus, although localized in, a pla in place and time, the significance of it regarding the play of identities, I submit, has a wider relevance. Jews and Muslims, over time, had evolved strongly opposed and yet associated identities they have under specific Islamic law status of normative inequality in favor of Muslims, evolved historic forms of coexistence, such as the famous one in medieval Spain, dubbed convivencia by Americo de Castro. So I will use mimuna and convivencia, inter, inter, convivencia, conviviality, living together. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the place is in the medieval town of Demnat, seated in a verdant valley on the northern hip foothills of the High Atlas Mountains. This is roughly 300 kilometers south of Casablanca, the economic capital of the country, and 100 east of Marrakesh, most known by tourists. In the 1950s, it had a population of less than 15,000, perhaps one-fifth or a quarter of it Jewish. It was one of the, the fifth J Jewish town, as we used to call it uh, in Morocco. Uh, uh, uh. So Morocco, like no other North African Muslim countries, has had a sizable Jewish population settled there before the advent of Islam and enriched over the centuries by new immigrants, notably from Spain during the Inquisition and after the Reconquista. I will call the celebration Mimuna as an anthropologist using the name used by the peoples themselves, the Jews, and also the Muslims, and sometimes refer to it as convivencia. The last term enhanced the relevance of the case to other situations, historical and otherwise. One may use it to describe the effort at building coexistence among Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Jains, Parsis, Jews, and atheists under, Alex under uh, uh, the great morale. The event I comment on in this paper occurred, as I said, in 1950. It was reported 
some 40 years later by an educated Jewish man who, was, who, who had seen it. I myself saw similar practice in my youth in my hometown, uh, some 50 kilometers to the north and during the same period. I'm a colonial product, as you know. And Muslims and Jews were aware of the existence of these practices around the country and elsewhere. One important point about these practices, as, as reported, is that they are properly colonial. That is, they happened under French rule. Morocco gained its independence only in 58, and decolonization in North Africa and West Africa was completed only in the mid-1960s. I will come back to this point in the later development of this essay. For now, I want to suggest how the case may be seen as relevant to identity conflicts in our contemporary world and I don't use post-colonial, often spoken of as post-colonial. For this, I have to spell out in detail my anthropological argument and to venture in another argument crossing disciplines, as I, I, as, as I said, which usually belong to the province of political philosophy. Thus, after evoking the wide resonance of the case for different areas, I want to justify its relevance to the contemporary uh, from an anthropological and philosophical perspective. Needless to say, my attempt can only be a fragmentary one. Interpreted in its legal, social, and colonial context, Mimuna uh, of this ceremony offers insights into one way in which difference in community were structured. The crucial point here is the set of relations and the principles which orient them toward the recognition of difference and antagonism yet at the same time moderate them so that people claiming difference could nonetheless hold together. Difference in this context also means order in hierarchy and inequality. But as I will stress, inequality is sanctioned in some domains of life only, which however does not systematically translate into other domains, say for example from the political to the economic as the situation in modern settings tend to do. That is, differences tend to translate from one domain uh, to another. As I said, my case is colonial. However, I think it offers a glimpse into the institu these institutional and social arrangements within a long tradition uh, which predates colonialism. And it also teaches us an important lesson that may be useful when we think about how to deal with warring identities in the present. Why that lesson should be used and how is best clarified, I think, by stating what the case at hand can offer in terms of accounting for the work of identities in connection with identity formation. As a matter of fact, many current views of identity formation rely on analytics derived, albeit in diverse manners, from the Foucauldian, Michel Foucault, genealogical approaches an influential example of which can be found, for example, in the works of anthropologist Talal Asad. In this perspective, identities, religious or secular, are accounted for as the end result of the formation of the self through practices inculcated by discursive tradition, disciplinary power relations, and impact of state institutions. In this framework, the acting subject do not produce any part of their lives of their forms of, li of lives, since subjectivity, according to this view, is itself produced. The, the, the trouble is that as soon as we adopt other methods of study besides textual techniques, for example, ethnographic approaches based on long interlocution with contemporary living subjects, or a familiarity with lives from the past, the subjects in question appear more reflexive and more confronted with conflicts and discrepancies they have to sort out. This sort of reflexivity is not one that deals in pure intellection and symbolic construction. It is a reflexivity in act, as I have described it elsewhere. A reflexivity in act, within, within action. In this sort of reflexivity that I find at work in the dynamics of Mimuna, and that I try to, I try to account for, in the process we see a necessary practical sorting out that is no less reflective. And in this convivencia, it was rendered more, not less, urgent given the radically transformative colonial situation. I suspect the sorting out is all, all the more urgent today in our contemporary predicament. 
In a nutshell, and as it appears from the event, Jews and Muslims seem to entertain a distanced self within the self, a self as a Jew and a self as Muslim, and another one as a Jew or Muslim who is capable of befriending respectively the Muslim or the Jew. This discrepancy, this gap and its reconciling, problematic as it was enduring under colonial and contemporary condition, may be correlative uh, with other uh, gaps we have to reconcile today, or resembles other gaps we have to reconcile today. At any rate, it would seem that we have in the practice of our own societies, some brands of relativism we, we could reclaim in a cross-fertilizing effort with Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment relativisms. Having staked my claims from a standpoint of anthropological approach, I now move across uh, uh, disciplines to, to, to some philosophical speculation that I would do later at the end of the paper. I will quick, quickly reflect on the French case regarding secularism and the so-called integration of Muslims. This reflection shows that beyond their difference, a genealogical approach and a progressive liberal approach are in agreement in denying reflexivity, practical or otherwise, to Muslim communities and others in Europe. However, there is a difference. Talal Assad, for example, presents both French secularists and Muslims who accept secularism or compromise as simply disciplined subject. For his side, Habermas, as representative of libera lib liberal progressive, again to take another example, restricts reflexivity to post-Renaissance Europe. The assumption is that Muslims and others lack critical distance vis-a-vis -vis their tradition. This is this assumption that I'm going to criticize at the end of my paper. I intend to revisit the discussion of the re regime of universal rights in the progressive liberal theory via Habermas' view on religion and the public sphere. A return on these issues as reflected through the mirror of my Mimuna localized case may help consider anew the relation between identity, equality, and universal rights and the secular institutions. This is especially relevant to the current relations, situation of Muslim communities in Europe, an example that yet again resonates in context beyond Islam in Europe. One crucial point is that the relation between homogeneity, heterogeneity, and equality is not clear. Another one is that trust, indispensable for accommodation of radically different identities, can possibly be obtained without the precondition of love or even sympathy. If this is so, the two should be analytically separated. This crucial factor remains the practical form of reciprocity that work at mitigating unequal relationships based on normative systems. And this is the second part of my argument would be much briefer than the first one. I divide this paper in four parts, in, a in five parts. First, the study of Mimonides' contexts, or context, or contexts in plural. Second, the giving, receiving of yeast and the giving back, or the circulation of ferment in food. Third, mimuna or convivencia as expansion of self. Uh, fourth, the mutual gift of autochthony. Fifth, in the end, the accommodation of difference. Uh, uh, convivencia, secularism, public sphere, and multiculturalism. That's the end of my reflection. First, the story of mimuna, and I read the report that I'm going to uh, comment uh, with you here by uh, uh, quote, the last day of Pesach, the day of the Mimuna gave a spectacular example of these manifestations of friendship, i.e. between Jews and Muslims. Some Jewish families in, fact, in festive clothes, singing to the rhythm of their tambourines and yu-yu, forming a happy uh, procession, went to get the yeast from a non-Jewish family to which they were connected by a relation of friendship and who participated in this tradition. The piece of yeast, huge set in, in flour, as if on a throne, symbol of plenty and luck, symbol of mimuna. It was put on a tray loaded with all sorts of goodies, bowls of fresh butter, of honey, dates, walnuts, and almonds. People sung, congratulated each other, and danced before lifting this baraka, which was accompanied by flowers, green branches, green beans, in stems, and mint. All this will be presented at the table at the table of hospitality, which will be attended all evening and until late at night by groups of youths 
you Jews and non-Jews often in costumes, that is, uh, in masquerading. These young men traded food, fig alcohol, and vendu, soft wine, uh, uh, or simply buttermilk, symbols of whiteness and fermentation. They also traded trabhu, that is wish of good luck in, in Berber, or wish of prosperity, uh, my translation. This narrative with a picture appeared in a recent book about the history and life of Moroccan Jewry. Elias Harous, who wrote it in French, is a Jewish man who lived in the region. He was a teacher who supervised modern schools specifically designed for the education of Jews under colonialism. This was a system established under French colonial rule in collaboration with some Jewish organizations. Harous was born in a town not far from Dimnet and presumably a laureate of that school system. For him, as for many others, this was an avenue of social mobility and de facto emancipation from the old Sharia status of non-Muslims living under Islamic rule and an avenue for social mobility. The French had introduced an equivalent, if more restricted system of education for Muslims with comparable outcomes. Uh, <coughs> Muslims and Jews, uh, 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 the time of the event narrated is 1950, as I said. That is very shortly after the defeat of the Arab armies in Palestine and the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. This news spread far and wide across Morocco and in the Arab world. Nonetheless, the celebration as described was taking place. In the region where Harus lived and worked, this news reverberated in many media, including poetry. Muslims and Jews, in, as a matter of fact, shared the well-known tradition of common poetry challenge and performance. Quite ritualized, it included challenge and satire, followed by reconciliation and banter. After the war in Palestine, as it was called, some of these poetic challenges compared bravery and cowardice on each side, publicly. And the French rule, Moroccan Jewish, the Moroccan Jewish community, numbering as much as 300,000 out of total of 8 million, enjoyed the relative prosperity, and Dimnat was no exception. Also, the Jews no longer lived in practice under the Islamic law of Dimitri. To be sure, the latter was not abrogated, but under French law, it was not rule, it was no, no, not any longer implemented. The landing of American troops in Casablanca in 44 and the victory of the Allies against Nazi Germany certainly enhanced the position of Jewish elites. Profound structural change affected Moroccan society with far-reaching consequences. It unsettled the categories of the social order and set in motion massive migration of Jews and non-Jews to the big urban centers and beyond. An added and crucial factor here was the systemic, systematic action of Zionist organization in, in, in favor of an exodus to Israel. However, despite these transformations, Elias Harus writes about close friendship between Muslims and Jews in commercial transactions, solidarity in daily life, friendship and mutual help at work. Of particular relevance to an understanding of this coexistence is an observation he makes about religion, i.e., he signals a total absence of religious polemic between a total, he signals a total absence of polemic religious polemic between Jews and Muslims. Within this context of togetherness that evolved in several uh, spheres of life, religion is the major divide. True, Judaism and Islam had communalities. As practiced in Morocco, those communalities have come to represent a shared part of identity. Monotheism, doctrine of salvation, kindred hermeneutics, legal practice and manifestation of divine grace on earth were part of a common law, ideas of divine grace, especially in saints' veneration, and of charismatic powers brought Jews and Muslims close together. However, these communalities did nothing to mitigate the radical divides. For example, dietary laws were closed, but what was permitted or prohibited different, differed sharply. Belief in prophecy was common but a similar concept of prophecy went for the Jews with denial of prophethood to the prophet of Islam. 
Many more mutual negation and, and denegations were entertained and entrenched. A crucial point for our discussion of Mimuna and Jewish-Muslim relation is that each side was perfectly similar, uh, familiar with the sentiment the other side held about the creed identity of the other. There was no pretense uh, uh, on this. Each repeated those views in sermons, speeches, invocations, prayers in mosques and, and synagogue. Yet, for some reason, a practice of moderation seems to have gained a gr ground throughout the shared past, despite the fact that it massively outnumbered, Jews, of course, were in no position to engage in polemics. Be that as it may, this, this sort of understanding seems to have been a long-standing one, not entirely contingent on rapport, on rapport de force. And that is the point. Uh, 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 uh. Before I comment on the text, I wish to say two or three things. One, of course, uh, the text itself uh, can be read as a, ha as a fiction. It silences many things. It does not speak about the colonial presence. It does not say who is engaged really and whom. Uh, uh, in other words, it is, looks like an aestheticized sort of evocation that erases con tons of contradictions and, uh, and, uh, and discrepancy. Yet, what I claim is that any work of interpretation is in fact a dismantling of texts. This dismantling, uh, uh, it is dismantling. It's, it's enough to try any text, literally or otherwise, to find yourself that you're dismantling it. Dismantling is very crucial to my proposition here. This, might, this dismantling means that whatever fictionality erases uh, uh, political play, politics of form, you may highlight regarding any text, including the report that I'm talking about uh, today. When you dismantle it, the more you go into the minisa of details, the less politics and poetics is involved. I'm not saying that the politics of form or, uh, is completely absent or gone, but I'm saying that the more you go to these minute details, the more you can take the dismantled pieces as part of empirical reality that you can use for thought. And this is what I am uh, trying uh, uh, to do here. This is a far cry for two things, from textual analysis, either inspired by Foucault or, or Derrida, uh, because no matter what you do, discourse cannot erase, or discursive theory cannot erase those empirical uh, minutia details that you obtain by dismantlement of text. This dismantlement of the text, by the way, although Derrida and Foucault practice it very, very widely, uh, but they practice it to sort of reassemble uh, according to uh, discursive theory or to disperse according to the theory of dispersal of the, of the science. Contrary to a method like that one, I want to take those little empirical facts and reassemble them and find out what sort of lesson I can uh, draw from them. One of the uh, 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 important things that, uh, that are here, uh, that I want to, uh, to, 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 to hear, is that <coughs> uh, 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 I can reassemble them, but when I reassemble them, I'm not pretending that the celebration that I'm describing concerned everybody in Morocco or in Demna, Jews and non-Jews. I'm not saying that everybody was convinced by it. <laughs> and in fact, I myself criticized the report of Harus as uh, reporting uh, and the Jews and Muslims who did it as celebrating as if nothing has happened while in fact we are under dire transformation by, by colonialism in the 50s, but it's important for me to highlight the fact that Jews and Muslims were doing it as if <laughs> uh, that sort of conviviality was still going on, as if change 
uh, uh, has not happened. Of course, there might be a conservative hinge to it, but 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 it's beside the point uh, here uh, for for uh, uh, for my analytics. So uh, with that, let me say one more thing: uh, the method and the approach that I am talking, since it di it does believe that the less, the more detailed dismantlement you go, the more you go into something that is not. Uh, permeated or less permeated by the politics of form, if you want to put it that way. This is a methodology or an approach that doesn't believe in the so-called suspension of truth. Uh, uh, those, uh, those bits and pieces that I'm going to reassemble in interpretation, I take them as true, including the, 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 uh, including the celebration itself. It's occurring, uh, uh, et cetera. Obviously, uh, there are many, many theories of truth. I take them as truth to contend with, to talk about, to argue with, not as some kind of absolute, uh, a sort of uh, you know, uh, radical empiricist uh, way. Uh, so the, the, the before going uh, on, I say one more thing. The interpretation that I'm doing is like Harus's text. Why? Harus's text is a mediation between past and present. It's obviously a work of memorialization, but it's a mediation between the past and the, and the present. My text, as an interpretation, wants to be an interpretation that is a thoughtful mediation uh, uh, between that form and our past, uh, uh, and our past today. In, 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 in Morocco uh, 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 and elsewhere. And being a mediation for me as a Moroccan, it means that it is both intimate, we are distanced, i.e. critical. So this is how I conceive of interpretation that I'm going to, uh, uh, to uh, Haru's text mediates the reader interest in the past. My commentary is another mediation between a tradition and some vital concerns from our contemporary lives. Following a lead from Gadamer, I take understanding to be, quote, a reconstruction, uh, not a reconstruction of an original, but a thoughtful mediation with contemporary life. As such, it can only be an existential engagement and a dialogic one. It is important to realize that this engagement is not something that one brings into the situation from some kind of external position to it. The celebration I will engage will, will, has been always already involved in my own world as a pre-reflexive reality, this in pre Here, understanding and interpretation will be necessarily a thematization of that historical, not historical, historical in the Hegelian sense, historical uh, uh, pre-reflexive being with a return both intimate and distance, i.e. critical. So I start, the last day of Pesach, the day of Mimuna. Thus, Harur starts his description. Pesach, in the colonial Arabic of my generation, was Fsach, a word one recognized in Tfaska one of the names in Berber for the Muslim feast of sacrifice. Pesach, Fsach, is a translation, transliteration, transformation. Mimuna, a word of many meanings, good omen, luck, and hope. It is also a good Muslim name from feminine in masculine form for a person. The root developed in an exceptionally wide semantic field, creed, faith, piety, protection, assurance, reassurance, all good things to pray and wish for at, at, as this day of the Mimuna is the first day of the new year, or new Jewish year. The, 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 it is the end of Pesach cycle, the exit from this cycle, its taboos and restrictions. Among the latter, there was the taboo on the possession and use of yeast, hence the gift of yeast by Muslims. A passage within an, within an original passage remembered at Pesach, the story of the exodus of the Jews from Pharaonic Egypt, according to Jewish tradition, mi miraculous passage of the Nile, which saved them from the Firuz armies. The episodes uh, of, of that flight from Egypt are narrated in the Haggadah. 
in 1950s Demnat, as elsewhere, they were read and mediated and meditated. The sufferings along that journey were revisited by eating madza, i.e. non-yeasted and non-salted cracker, before they will go to bring so, uh, uh, yeast from the Muslims. As I summarize, it is the story of a passage from bondage to freedom, or else a story of failed accommodation of difference and hopeful move towards a better future. I, uh, I cannot think of a better word for it in the particular place where it was remembered than the Judeo-Arabic Mimuna, which is good omen. Muslims were familiar with the ceremonial and the Haggadah, uh, of course, and sometimes they called it Uggada, that is narrative, story, something to be recounted, recited, but also a string of knots, as if human destiny gets knotted, knot by knot, knot by knot, along a cord, a reckoning in one word. It is, of course, uh, the story of an event or a set of events from the past as narrated and reenacted by the Jews. In it is in one side of a confrontation between them and ancient Egyptians. Obviously a one-sided story, the politics of it, I leave aside here. Muslims gave yeast and received matzah. The ceremonial was widespread in Morocco. One partner gave the ferment for bread, the other the non-salted, non-fermented crater. The conjunction of the two substances signals the return to normal life after hardship. Muslims shared time, i.e. cooked food among themselves, while Jews, on this occasion, they shared the ferment with Jews and the fermented. Yeast in the first place, but also wine, which Muslims are not supposed to, to drink, or in the absence of it, buttermilk, still a half-fermented substance. In the ceremony, as described by Harus, Jews gave back hospitality and repast. One guesses the work of dietary rules, but also that of transgression. Muslims, for example, are not supposed to drink wine. Muslims are allowed to eat Jewish cooked food. Jews are not allowed to eat Muslim cooked food, except bread. We have a first glimpse at a certain order, one of relation in separation, distance in proximity, difference in identity, however, it seems as if identity appears under two conditions. The first was that both Muslims and Jews wore the same carnivalesque costume and drank the same transforming drink. The second was that the carnivalesque guys should put them at a distance from each category, i.e. it should put them respectively at a distance from the category Jew and from the category uh, Muslim. I will come back to this point for the time being it is clear that the ritual brings Muslims and Jews together and simultaneously underline their difference. So there's no effacement of, 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 of difference here. The Haggadah is a story of flight, separation, suffering, and hope, but also of power and empowerment. That story, as it is used, as it used to be recounted in Demnat, houses and synagogues, is one of connectedness and separation. Feru is the common enemy of two communities related by agreements and oppositions. Muslim and Jews had their scriptures and books of law. Separately, each had their classificatory system and categories of pure impur, which regulated contact between the two. In the case at hand, a general line of separation produced two systems of classification, many terms of which were opposed while others overlapped. Conceptual oppositions, inversions, total or partial, operate in simultaneity. In the Demnat of 1950s, one could certainly infer them from the books of scriptures and law. However, this would be only part of the story that unfolded through the encounter of scriptures and their bearers. Here, it did specifically indifference and gift. The latter does not cancel out the first, as we know from the teachings of Levi-Strauss. However, the circulation we witness here is not one between equal terms or between equal communities or sub subcommittees, as the founder of structuralism implied to say he didn't account for any difference in terms of hierarchy in otherwise or inequality. Structure as a dual opposition and conciliation through gift has given way in our case to a mode of exchange between hierarchical positions, but neither hierarchical difference in complementarity a la Dumont would do for what is it at work here is a regulated power distribution and a tributary status coupled with multiple freedoms. 
Jews gave vi visit in music and dance. This initial gift may be related to their hitherto subject position, yet Muslims were not in a position to refuse the gift. Insofar as it had to be accepted, the dominant had to submit to accepting the demand and to giving. True, this can be counted for as noblesse oblige. Nonetheless, if there is a major disadvantage at soliciting yeast, there's also an advantage in being entitled to it. Everything happens as if the major and minor key of a partition could not be played out separately. Each sign connected a signifier to a signify, yet the minor key of the latter exceeded the concept. An excess in search of signs. The demand of yeast as a gift was responded to by the giving of yeast with honey, fruit, stems, and green branches, goodwill and friendship in excess of yeast. Noblesse oblige is certainly a factor, but no amount of it can dictate an exact quantity and quality for such a response. The most difficult thing about the gift is that you can never decree what sort of quantity or quality has to be given and given back, uh, and that's where. At this juncture, we may look at a trembling that insinuates itself with excess, a trembling which remains <coughs> like an exteriority to signifiers and signified, and to meaning. Jews and Muslims, giving and giving back, also shared in the Abrahamic, Ibrahimic sacrifice. It is not the place here to restate the overlapping between gift and sacrifice as it was uh, developed. As far as the two traditions I analyze uh, in the present article, and they are concerned, I develop an idea I find incoherent in Moses' theory of gift. Moses insisted that in gift giving, it is impossible to sever the tie between the giver and the given object. I elaborate this notion, and I call this, expan this expansion of self in order to pursue my interpretation of Mimuna. And this has not only Moses' reverberation, but also Marxist ones. It, you can't separate, you know that. Uh, the theory of labor in Marx is precisely, and value is precisely that impossibility to separate completely uh, uh, the person from the, or the collectivity of persons for the thing they produce uh, and that you turn into a commodity. So that's just one, one comment in, in passing. I want now to talk about Mimuna as expand, expansion of self. Jews and Muslims celebrated sacrifice, although in different modality, as a prototype of and for action and redemption. Both knew that between life and redemption, a gap remained open. Both articulated forms of life as an anticipation of redemption. Mimuna was one of those numerous and recurrent moments and ways of re-articulating that tradition. That is to say, also a moment of re-articulation of selfhood with gap and excess as its condition of possibility. In this context, the return of yeast manifests the gap and some simultaneously close it. Yeast as ferment permits the controlled transformation of certain ingredients into bread, thus giving it is a gift of life. And hamid, that is in, in, in Judeo-Arabic ferment, brings about happy life. Beyond this, there is also the ways in which yeast works, rises, and transforms. It transforms itself and transforms all the ingredients. It is a passive active agent and its work is passive active. active. In other words, the mode of its being is simply transition. The celebration of Pesach takes seven days, but it proceeds only from a total cleansing of utensils, belongings, and dwellings from impurity, i.e. from the, their use in ordinary life. The cleansing includes reading the house of yeast. Thus, during the moment, that moment, when it has to be out, yeast is impure. The, 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 for the celebration, and for the celebration to begin, yeast has to be removed. But what sort of beginning is this? Uh, uh, I think it's simply a beginning after another beginning, celebrating another beginning that go back religiously to an origin. Uh, that, that notion of religious origin does not sit well with many secular theories of non-origin that one finds in Edward Said, Derrida, uh, uh, Nietzsche, and, and others. In any case, yeast it, as a transforming power, passive active is neither origin nor beginning, but becoming. And as a present, essentially projected 
in what is coming. It is a present uh, projected in what's coming. Pesach is the rite of passage as set in, inseparable from what is coming and from transition. Lots of anthropologists have recognized this a long time ago. Thus, it is not surprising that it should end by a procession around the East. Here, transforming opens a space that changes the place, the mnet. It precipitated it in a third dimension, that of poetics and deuteronomy, most specifically in a co-presence in tension with politics and poetics. Around the East and flower, there are beautiful and delicious ob objects such as honey, dried fruit, flower, and green branches, the latter inseparable from any great Moroccan celebration. And of course, music and dance. Music and dance open up that third dimension. This is worth more than a mention in passing, for the subject of music is hardly ever reflected upon with reference to the kind of action I am considering. Music and dance for the gift of yeast are made by the people themselves and for themselves. They make it, and yet they are stimulated, enthralled by it. The performer, a participant listener, lives in it for the occasion. The point I wish to emphasize is the following. If there is any active subjectivity here, it moves towards an ever elusive totality, but it does move in that direction. Uh, it moves, and it is moved by itself. That sort of elusive totality includes and escapes the individual subject in every direction. Where then is the subject? In the body? Certainly not in the body as object of knowledge, medical or otherwise, still less in the body as bare life, although body and person have been reduced on a massive scale to bare life by the Nazi machine and by colonial use of the human as body to enslave, to extract use and exchange value from, or to simply eradicate by genocide. And neither finally a subject can finally be found in a disciplined body, although it takes habitus and discipline to play mimuna and to listen um, uh, to the music. Is it in the mind or in the mind-body conjunction? The, this last locution itself fails to indicate the concreteness of the force of the subject, which eludes, exceeds itself through its own movement. In that subject, if that subject loses the sense of self at times or permanently, under ordinary circumstances, it never fails to experience the self, even though it may not always con contemplate a body or mental image of it. For this reason, the notion of subject cannot be exhausted by organism, body, spirit, discourse, or their life. And neither can it be simply dispelled by discourse or dispersed by the circulation of science uh, in a Davidian uh, uh, sense. Jews and Muslims in the 50s appear to go along an expansion of the self and community within limits, and this is important. The ceremony traces that expansion, the distance covered, the demand, the gift, the gift of demand and allegiance, the gift of yeast as exercised in preeminence within attendant limits. Flowers, honey, dried fruit. That is, that they limit preeminence that is obvious there between Jews and Muslims, Muslims being the dominant, uh, of course. Uh, could Muslims befriend Jews? Yes, if subjects find themselves expanding with limits. <laughs> Without those limits, expansion would turn into invasion. Could Jews feel expanding beyond prejudice and the scars left by dimitude? Uh, uh, then a de facto uh, obsolete status Yes, if they can feel endeared by honey, dried fruit, flowers, green branches, and, uh, and stain, and give acceptance to this. And they did. The third dimension I already encountered appear here again. Expanding is mutual. It is an, exist an existential manifest form of being, an aporia. Beyond that, it is living and expanding self, living, living it. As such, it is migration of self. Seen from the angle of expansion with limits and migration of self, expansion as colonization is expansion, of course, without limit, without even a hierarchical reciprocity as the one that I'm describing um, uh, here. In expansion as colonization, there is migration of self only to find and confirm the self. Instead of an expansivity, 
that would make the other close enough and yet different. Colonialism develops an abstract knowledge about self and other enclosed in colonizer and colonized selves. Expanding the self is gift with limits, which is what's occurring here. It does not cancel out domination and hierarchy, as I insist. It exceeds both by means of friendship and goodwill. As we glimpse it into this mimuna, it works through a process of transformation and transgression. The yeast ceremony deployed trespassing in costumes, drinking wine together by young Muslims and Jews. Each recognized the supreme value of the line crossed and reinvested their respective identity with that value beyond difference and hierarchy. This beyond, I submit, is better understood as besides and not an ifibum a la Hegel. Let's now consider uh, the central actor of the ceremony, yeast. Elias Harus calls it baraka. He writes that it was placed on a sort of tray, that it sat there as on a throne, his word. He also says that people lifted this baraka. The piece of yeast is a baraka, and indeed it is baraka itself. The word is a vital is as vital to the anthropology of the Maghreb in Islam in general as was mana uh, for the anthropology of Melanesia in its spiritual thought. And for that reason, this word is polysemic, difficult, and confusing. In Demnat, I heard it called Barakat and written Baraka by Elias Harus. Uh, 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 a search for one word, for example, if you do the experience to search for one word which could be opposed uh, as its exact negative to Baraka would be fruitless. You would, anyone who would try would, would, would be taken into a limitless semantic proliferation. Void, evil, wretchedness, the contrary of Baraka. Depopulation, harm, anything, evil. It would take us to the limits of our world itself and beyond to incohete meanings without words, since as Levi Strauss wrote, there might be more to signify than our av available signifiers. signifiers. Admittedly, this is a floating signifier which confronts us in a similar way uh, as its skins, mana, orenda, manito, and others. However, and I'm sure that in other languages you have other things like this, I want to stress that we have to move away from thinking about them as signs whose function would be only to close a system of linguistic signs. For, on the contrary, they seem to break, words like baraka seem to break open toward the expansion of language and meaning. This possible surplus is what makes possible the proliferation of signs as traces. And if we encounter the latter through language, we have no compelling reason to think the opening as coincident with language. Baraka is opening, or more exactly, what can be inferred from this or that opening Anthropologists had remarked on the quasi-impossibility to define it or translate it, grace, charisma, manifestation of divine holiness, etc. Gears rightly pointed out that Baraka can only be seen in its impact, which always stands out of the ordinary. If that is so, I may add another translation, which is simply power. As another translation, a floating signifier, moreover, Baraka manifests itself both as substance and relation. A power as source of all powers. It is also a source of power in the ordinary sense of the term. Baraka does not know of subject-object divide. It is clear uh, uh, from yeast as Baraka in, in the same way of, 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 using ye of t talking about yeast as Baraka in the same way as a person can be also said to be Baraka. The miracle of that power moves endlessly between affect and affected subjects and objects. As such, Baraka held sway among Jews and Muslims with no particular infliction uh, along the divine line. Power to heal, to, 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 to condemn, to do all these things. Uh, uh, yeast sat there as Baraka on a throne with the connotations of power, of course. Baraka, it will be remembered, bring different people together, not by transcending difference, by but by assuming differences. By being power, Baraka also operate within all the spheres of specific power and politics. Thus, it, rati it relativizes, so to speak, both power and politics. Baraka, therefore, works at the divide 
between Jews and Muslims, especially in the configuration of sainthood. Saint's Baraka, a pervasive one, connected them in a similar ideas and practices, although each had their venerated shrines. Sometimes Jews and Muslims shared in the same one. I know of one of these, most directly, since I was taken to it as a child. Muslims visited the shrine from Tuesday to Friday before midday. Jews from Friday afternoon to Monday. The name was a program itself, Sidi Mashkuk, translation, my lord, the doubtful. Nobody knew if he was a Muslim or a Jew, or nobody cared to push the inquiry. And this is as matters stood, as uh, far as public discourse was, 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 was concerned. Since from this perspective, habitus or subjectivity formation under authoritative practice and within specific regimes of truth do not exclude distance and forms of reflexivity, and that's my central point with practices themselves, within practices themselves. And the more so as ritual practices, such as the ones of the Mimona, seem to vindicate continuity in the circumstances of radical change. This effort to act as if things are not changing is itself a distanced attitude vis-a-vis -vis change and continuity. As such, habit and discipline are unable to account for, for what it is, what is at the height of transformation and the colonial destructuration. Bourdieu and his followers do not appear to, re to realize the contradiction in their own thinking, that in speaking about habitus and discipline, later on, I said in others, about the place and people for whom everything is changing, and they are searching, trying to, to, to sort of uh, make sense of the gap, and contradictions in habits and customs are expressed and thought about. So, how does it make sense to come there between the 50s and the 80s and speak today about you know, embodied habitus or disciplined subjects? I don't uh, uh, really know how one can do. The forms of distance and reflexivity I have tried to show at work in this Mimuna are pervasive in many practices throughout the Maghreb and probably elsewhere. This brings into focus the status of the non-modern. I use this word in order to avoid the pitfalls of the word pre-modern. However, I hope to reclaim all these practices that discourses erase, including old forms such as uh, of Mimuna, evolved in times long past, but celebrated within colonial and contemporary conditions. Genealogies of religion, secularism, and identities have seldom concerned themselves with these forms. Neither have they paid much attention to concrete actions in institutions evolved under colonialism. Finally, genealogies of religion in the context of the colonial encounter ended up simply reaffirming Western discursive uh, dominance. So I'm going to move now uh, 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 in, 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 in the next section and say that if I am doing this interpretation, I'm not claiming, again, a native point of view or some sort of theory of culture with bounded communities cohesive, etc. What I have said about Zionism and all these things is testify to the contrary. What I take culture to be is a field of, of uh, conflict, accommodations, compromise, reconflicts that is open to all kinds of currents, both local and worldly. Uh, and I hope this is clear uh, uh, now. I want now to move to this quickly now to this uh, what I call mutual gift of autochthony. Uh, and it's a, the reflection, part of my reflection on the existence of extreme, extreme identities. Difference placed Muslims and Jews along a horizontal axis of contrasting attributes as well as a vertical one, since classification was also hierarchical between them. Mimuna introduced a carnivalesque space of insubordination which did not suppress but circumscribe distinctions and hierarchy. In this, there is no communitas, as, as, as I insist, in the common celebration, but also in lifestyle, production, consumption, influence, stratification, as well as class relations, crossed through the Muslim uh, uh, the Jewish divide, even though hierarchy was maintained. So the notion is not so much that to deny hierarchy, that to find uh, the, 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 the actions and the practice that mitigate, mitigates uh, its result and probably find, makes a compensation. 
one of the major things that I would conclude on uh, in like five minutes now is that <coughs> political domination and inequality, which was sanctioned by custom, by law, and then customary, does not in that system translate into free other domains like the economic. So it's this absence of translation from one domain to the other that makes it possible, I contend, to find compromises and to find compensatory uh, mechanism to a system which was obviously politically in favor of, of Muslims for centuries. And, and it's, 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 it's an, an equal system. So Mimuna opened what I called a third dimension. Revisiting Marcel Moore's reflection on gift giving, I find his notion of ultimate inseparability of gift from the giver illuminating. That inseparability is the third dimension, which is the moral one. The subjects involved are transmitters of things, which are their property, yet these things are also a sum of relations between humans and between humans and non-humans, objects. As such, even as products of capital of labor, here, you know, I'm calling Marx, of course, they can neither be totally divorced from the human agent as collectives of related individuals, nor, from, nor uh, being divorced from the fact that they are a gift of life, ultimately. <coughs> A reality, the recent one, Western concept of product, of nature, product, etc., does not exhaust. Gift and counter gift entail obligation and mutual obligation. Its dynamics could also work to challenge. There is in Mimuna some kind of challenge, but it's moot. Challenge is moot. On the other hand, sharing was manifest here, as in other examples recently explored in farm farm context. These elements widen the scope of the Mosian initial institution by including gift giving into the larger study of ontologies, cosmologies, and ethos, and by putting them in correlation with specific objects of knowledge and action regarding human and non-human beings. So Mimuna uh, ushered in the sharing of yeast, food, raw, cooked, music, dance, hospitality, ceremony, flowers, all that are objects of, of gift and counter gift. In fact, honey, congratulations, good wishes of success, etc. An expansion beyond two extremes. What Jews and Muslims gave each other was something else beyond religious identities and confrontation. It was a sense of belonging, which in a non modern fashion, uh, uh, referred to land, town, and community, although the latter was internally divided. I will call it shared autochtony. The, use, the usual objection here from constructivists and deconstructivists alike would be that auto autochtony is but a fantasy. However, I contend that mutually recognized autochtony is not an illusion insofar as it becomes a reference for actual action and coexistence. Regular and common participation in the celebration affirmed the mutual recognition of autochtony, a belonging together that is not territorial, although it happens in a territory, not based on common ancestry, although kinship metaphors may be present. A sort of civic belonging without a secular civitas. Thus, beyond sharing as fact, we need to reflect on the relation between sharing and autochtony. And when the latter is implicitly or explicitly denied, it is notorious that the intimate other and stranger becomes radically untrustworthy. A relation of mutual distrust obtains, as numerous examples show, Roma, gypsies, migrants, and all that. Autochtony and mutual granting of autochtony appear crucial to the building of trust. On the other hand, the latter fosters interactions, which in return consolidated. Church dialectics seems crucial to an interpretation of Mimuna. But how are we to understand trust in a situation in which uh, two radically opposed identity have to exist side by side in act relative peace? The answer, I think, seems to be contingent on an analytical separation between trust and love. Uh, although the two may, be, may go together, love is not a nece necessary condition for trust. The latter may indeed exist between adversaries and enemies. Uh, for example, regarding high value accorded to, mutual, uh, uh, to mut mutually to speech or promise. Thus, trust can obtain uh, between people separated by radical differences, as was the case between Muslims and Jews living together. 
To be sure, what Harris describes is something beyond that threshold. But the important thing here is that uh, 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 there is no relation between trust and love. You can have trust even in situations of relative enmity. And that permits people to stay uh, uh, besides each other and to build relations besides difference and, pol and polarization, besides. And this besides, I insist, is not a beyond because there is no re removal of difference. And it might be extremely difficult to try and build a society with difference, without difference, and without some order and hierarchy. I don't know. Uh, you chase hierarchy and order by the window, by the door, it comes back by the, by, by the window. For example, in the forms of political oppression under the guise of uh, you know, an apparatus that has purpose to bring people to equality altogether. We have seen that uh, uh, for most of the 20th century, I think. I'm going to, uh, to, to conclude now, very quickly, this long talk. Uh, and, uh, and I want to reflect quickly on secular public sphere and multiculturalism in the mirror of Mimuna. Remember that I'm trying to find the significance for our contemporary. Reflecting on our contemporary condition, what lesson can we draw from the convivencia I tried to approach through an interpretation of this demnat Mimuna? An important point of departure should be the recognition of the likelihood that extreme identities are not, are not things in, of the past, but a crucial aspect of the present and the future. If that is admitted, some of the principles underlying non-modern convivences and others evolved in colonial contexts as well as some which may be currently emerging will point to new questions and directions. By the same token, they may assume cognitive and practical relevance for our tremble, troubled time. From a cognitive standpoint, anthropology has now produced a massive body of literature on identity to the degree that we may speak of oversaturation. But uh, it's easy to remark that non-modern forms are hardly uh, uh, mentioned or, or, or studied. And forms, concrete forms, uh, de uh, derived in the time of colonization ha are rarely described as well. Well, those concrete evolved forms under that time may be ones that we are living on today. It's part of our heritage and it's very difficult to simply but talk about colonialism and post-colonialism by bypassing the concrete study of those evolved forms, forms, including to change them, of course, and to go uh, beyond them. We learn from the Dimnat Mimuna has interpreted several lessons. We learn to be attentive to change, reflexivity, and bricolage in contexts where predictability seems more problematic than in other contexts. These considerations are crucial regarding situations of novelty and uncertainty that obtained in the Morocco of 1950 and certainly elsewhere in the Middle East, but also uh, in the situations of, uh, of now. It is worthwhile here to reflect on the French public sphere as an example with reference to the so-called problem of integration of Muslims. Secularists contend that such integration is and should be based on the double principle of universal similarity and universal equality among citizens. That's the form of universalism that we know uh, uh, for French philosophy and practice. Both principles are predicated on a form of secularism called laïcité. We know now that laïcité, of course, has a history. The new Muslim presence, a colonial and post-colonial phenomenon, was only part of this historical process of laïcité. First, as colonial masses subject to the republic, and without voice, now as contemporary ones, wanted for cheap labor, but unwanted as political and civic, and civic visible agents. Today, the coalition of, of political forces identified it with secular discourse is a potent power which rallies majority of non-Muslim French uh, men and women around social as well as religious and cultural interests. It promotes public discourses, political maneuvers, and laws which tend to stigmatize Islamic lives. Under these circumstances, uh, with striking similarities all over Europe, it is also unclear how long it would be, uh, uh, it would take, and how to build a participative and equal for all public sphere through the exercise of public reason, uh, Allah Habermas. That model is pretended, 
presented as a solution to the uneasy but necessary adjustment uh, uh, of differing existential value in what Habermas calls post-secular and post-metaphysical world. I don't know for whom it is uh, post-secular and post-metaphysical uh, world, but that's a question I don't want to uh, uh, go into it. However, as important as they are, the Habermasian views provide no solution to the entrenched rapport de force I have mentioned. Besides, they ignore the fact that traditions provide persons with reference, orientation, protection, and self-esteem. All these things vital to uprooted people in society undergoing drastic change. It also ignores that those traditions as a source of empowerment, are a source of empowerment uh, to withstand moral stigmatization. But the most important point is that Habermas misconstruct the relation between tradition and reflexivity. And I have, I have already uh, reflected on this uh, 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 notion of reflexivity in action, reflexivity in, in concrete, besides, of course, the writings, the laws, the, the, the literature of these societies, of these so-called traditional societies, where there's a clear reflection on discrepancies, conciliation, failure, and all that. So I don't know where, ha where Habermas and others uh, uh, find this absence of reflexivity, which means that we, now in our societies, have to devote attention to those forms of reflexivity that existed and that different uh, 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 from the European ones. And in these reflexivities, we find brands of relativisms that I have described in the Mimuna uh, setting that, is, that are different relativisms from the wine of enlightenment and post-enlightenment. And there's no reason not to use those brands, those immense brands of relativism across non-European society in a cross-fertilization with, uh, with, the, with the European ones. I want to conclude now uh, 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 with a few words. It is, of course, both impossible and unsound to envision a return to the forms of convivencia and evolved under Islamic rule or to ones that developed under other circumstances, but a return on them, not to them may be worthwhile for the sake of speculation. For example, scenes from the angle of convivencia that I described, multiculturalism and secularism, present some thorny problems. Multiculturalism rests on a separation which leaves intact a strong correlation between economic and political inequality. Convivencia imposed an avowed power inequality, yet in it political power never correlated with the economic one. Multiculturalism also promotes separateness and respect, quote unquote, within a system of difference. Yes, it is also a system of indifference in which forms of mutual ignorance, forms of mutual thrive. In contradistinction to this aspect, convivencia separated and reproached at the same time. Seen through its mirror, it all looks as multiculturalism recognized difference on the condition that it be segregated. Multiculturalism, while the convivencia separated and, 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 and reproached. Multiculturalism as a phenomenon is, of course, diverse. In North America and Australia, for example, it came as a result of a colonialism which expropriated and displaced the indigenous peoples. In Australia, it produced a horrible situation in which the indigenous was forced into a position to prove her own rights to his own, her own land by performing a subjectivity that is a legal, legal subjectivity conform, in conformity to the neo-colonial demand uh, 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 of, the legal, of the Australian legal system. Elsewhere, uh, cultural identities you know, uh, uh, and communities are being fought for or renegotiated under more complex backgrounds of conquest, domination, conversion, and hybridization. In Europe, we have migrants' uh, struggles for cultural light. Visibly, vi for in Europe, we have migrants' struggle, struggles for cultural rights, visibility, and a share in power. This process is occurring under dark conditions in which majorities are reluctant to recognize the historicity of their own legal and cultural system and the work of their own cultures within uh, the supposedly universal. Uh, uh, public sphere. And of course, uh, we can object to Habermas that you know, we never know exactly uh, where the voice of reason speaks from. 
I don't know in, from which they speak from. Finally, secularism, especially in the French version of laïcité, rests on the principle of an assumed similarity, inequality, abstract one, with respect to the so-called public sphere. But as many analysts now recognize, such a principle amounts to ignoring real and enduring differences. Thus, the functioning of that public sphere seems to offer only a margin of acceptance of Muslim migrants and others with their differences. A particularly glaring problem can be located in what seems to be a low tolerance for heterogeneity, heterogeneity, low tolerance uh, for that. Or to put it differently, th here those noble principles of universalism are used as if heterogeneity should go with denial of belonging. In the convivencia configuration, it would seem that autochtony and heterogeneity were not in conflict. Jews, and it may be probably true for other systems than the one that I have described, particularly here in India or elsewhere, we have this long you know, traditional coexistence and living together uh, of different identities from the religious uh, side, of course. In the convivencia configuration, it would seem that autochtony and heterogeneity were not in conflict. Jews were politically unequal in the sense specified above, while equal in many other regards. What compensated up to a point for a negative political situation was a Muslim-Jewish mutual recognition, recognition of autochtony coupled with legitimized heterogeneity. Legitimized heterogeneity to begin moving towards solution with less polarizing results than the ones so far adopted. A reconsideration, a reconsideration of the principle of equality might be in order. Equality may well be premised on the rapport of similarity, but it may gain from a reconsideration of the primacy of such premise, reconsider, not negate that, but reconsider that premise to find out, to unpack it, because there may be a sense in which people could feel a type of equality predicated on the recognition of their heterogeneity. Uh, uh, needless to say, this may happen only if the partners conceive themselves and others as legitimately hot heterogeneous, i.e. heterogeneously equal, so to speak. Uh, Jews and Muslims in the net until the 1950s, and despite political strife uh, on the global scale, and despite change and, co and colonization, seems to have been willing to act that way, that is, grant recognition of equality and heterogeneity uh, uh, to each other. Heterogeneously equal, yeah, Jews and Muslims in the net until the 1950s, and despite change, seems to have been willing to act that way, at least in ceremony. At any rate, neither was branded as not belonging. Thank you.